Coming up next on Tech News Today, Twitter rolls out a new tool that filters out abusive tweets to protect its users. Also, Uber is making big moves in autonomous vehicles. Two announcements there. Uh, Epic banana and extra bacon isn't quite so tasty to Cisco. Uh, convincing universities to not sell its patents to trolls and to the moon on a taxi. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1580, recorded Thursday, August 18th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all in one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit www.wealthfront.com slash TNT and sign up to get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's www.wealthfront.com slash TNT. Welcome to the last oh, four o'clock. The last Pacific. four o'clock. Okay, yeah. Last four o'clock Pacific oh, show, yeah. Tech News Today show in the Brick House, our penultimate Tech News Today show. Tomorrow we're going to be at 10 a.m. It's going to be bright and early. Let's, 1 p.m. Eastern. Let's hope lots of news breaks before we get done with this show in the evening and we arrive on set first thing in the morning. <laughs> I'm planning on uh, waking up at 3.30 a.m. to start working. Sounds, sounds prudent. Sounds necessary. Uh, I wasn't planning on that, but now I feel like I kind of have to just to, you know, stay on par with uh -huh. the wiseness that you will bring to the table. Right. I was just saying that so you'd wake up early. I'm not okay. getting up that early. No way. I can't get up that early. I'm Megan Maroney. Oh, right. I'm Jason Howell. We've been talking forever, and you still don't know who we are. Uh, first story today. After being raked over the coals for sleeping at the wheel when it comes to harassment on Twitter. The company is finally pushing out two new tools that, well, new to most people anyways, that will have a dramatic effect on what tweet, tweets users are shown in their feeds. First, Twitter is adding an option that will limit notifications to only those accounts that the user follows. That's on desktop and on mobile. And second, and this is kind of the big deal here, it's making its quality filter available to all users. The quality filter allows a user to automatically remove tweets from view that conflict with a number of signals, things like the origin of the account or the user's uh, behavior in the past. Filters low quality content, things like duplicates, automated tweets that it recognizes. Um, it doesn't filter out content from those that you follow or interact with. So it basically assumes that if you're following or you've communicated with them in the past that you actually want to see what they have to say. And it also apparently screens for threats and offensive language. So uh, it's not just followers, it's people you've communicated before. Those are considered? That, that's what I read is that it's, yeah, it, it keeps you in connection with people you've followed and that you've, yeah. Responded to. Yeah, responded to. Uh, so... Yeah, I think the ability to manage notifications uh, better is great. Um, I, you know, I can, as all of us, we can only speak for our own experiences on Twitter. And mine has been a relatively good one. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's more good than there is bad. And, you know, it's a sort of, you take the good, you take the bad situation for me. Like, I wouldn't... You take them both, and there you have exactly, it. There you have the facts of Twitter. <laughs> but again, I... Uh, I do not get harassed as I know some other people do. Um, it's not all, you know, it's not all good either, but right. I, um, you know, and even the, like, I, I like when strangers tweet at me, you know, you made a mistake or, you know, you yeah. something like that. Like, I, I want to stay open. So I don't know that I would use these. I don't know if it's going to, to solve any problems for me. Apparently, these features have existed for a long time, but you only see them if you're verified. Um, at, at, since March 2015, to be exact, at least the um, at least the second one, the the uh, what is it called the whatever the one the one that you know allows you there's a name for it and I completely missed it the quality filter there we go uh, that has uh, that has been active since March 2015 and uh, you know 
apparently it's it's good for celeb you know it, it was used for celebrities and verified accounts to allow them to kind of trim down their accounts so that they can focus like you said take the good and reject the bad <laughs> block bad harness good as Phil Hartman once said um, <laughs> and so but which makes me wonder like Twitter's you know harassment problem has been a problem for a long time yet this tool totally existed and it was being isolated to you know celebrities and verified users. I guess, in a sense, to make them feel privileged or maybe because up until now, Twitter believed that only those accounts really would benefit from these tools. I just don't know why they didn't open it up sooner. It's a tool that exists that everybody can use, obviously, uh, to good measure. So why? Right. And it's why unclear. Wait? Well, I mean, they might have done it now because of the BuzzFeed article from last week that everyone That's, was talking about yeah. how they were a cesspool um, <laughs> and that they had all these tools that they were using, like you right. said, and using, you know, using tools that they had for President Obama that, you know, right. it's like, OK, I get that he deserves something different. But if you have it, it's just technology. Why not let everyone use it? Um, and I understand why not, too, because it, then it becomes a free speech issue. But I think this may be why they were pushed to deliver it now to everyone, to all us unwashed, unverified masses. But it kind of doesn't become a, a free speech issue in this regard because it's not getting rid of the tweets. No. The tweets are still there. They, you can say all the bad things you want about people. It's just that that person, if this is active, is not going to see it. So um, Yeah, no, they, in my them. opinion, they've not, you know, crossed any lines of free speech here. Yeah. yeah, it's just like you get to decide. And then, you know, it does cut up. It's basically they're saying, hey, this is our game. You know, this is the game. And if you don't want to play it, if you don't want to have... And, and I think most of us will continue to play it. I mean, most mm -hmm. of us want to hear what everybody says and, you know, we'll block the people that are very threatening. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't encounter a whole lot of, uh, you know, the, the negative talk on Twitter. So I don't know if I would necessarily activate this because I'm, I'm cool with keeping it wide open. But I know there are a lot of people that do and having the extra tools has got to be very useful. If anyone's mean to you on Twitter, tell me, and okay. I will harass them we'll endlessly. A, we'll get a Twitter okay? army Okay, together. I'm here for you. Okay. <laughs> Uber is dominating the tech news cycle today with two big self-driving car stories. The first is a deal with Volvo to put a fleet of 100 autonomous vehicles on the road by this summer. Dun, dun, dun. It's already summer. The spe specially modified Volvo XC90 sport util utility vehicles will be hitting the streets of Pittsburgh, PA, supervised by humans in the driver's seat, for now, rider, riders will be able to summon the self-driving cars with their phone from downtown just for short trips at the moment. And in the beginning, this will be free. Hmm, interesting. So please ride in our experimental car. We'll give you the ride for free. <laughs> I promise nothing wrong will happen. I'm sure nothing wrong will happen. Um, I put in a photo, actually, that I found on a subreddit post. Someone in Pittsburgh actually was like, oh, yeah, I just saw this the, the other day. So apparently they're on the streets already. There you go. Uh, probably a testing phase prior to this, of course. I wonder if this self-driving is like Tesla's autopilot, which is yeah. really just cruise control. Like, I mean, I don't know. We don't have any details of how this is exactly going to work. It's a short trip um, around downtown. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll believe it and be excited when I see it. Um, Sam Bulsamid, who's been on the show many times, Navigant Research, he wrote up on Forbes and was kind of reading through there. Uh, he says that engineers from each company are go there is going to be a collaborative relationship, obviously, between them. But Uber ultimately is purchasing the cars that Volvo is 100 percent in control of creating, um, which is very different from the current model for for Uber. Right. Like right now, Uber's fleet is made up of people who all who own their cars outright and who manage them, who are not employees, I should add. Um, and, you know, in this case, it would be Uber kind of creating their own fleet, purchasing their own cars for the fleet, and really just kind of putting themselves into uh, a control scenario, you know, control of their destiny, basically, uh, with self-driving cars. So it's uh, definitely a shift. Feels no pun intended. <laughs> it's a shift in this race. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> take it to the next level. Uh, the second announcement is the acquisition of commercial self-driving startup Auto. That's O-T-T-O that was started by two ex-Googlers. Now, this could push Uber ahead in the robot car race, as many experts agree that they are well behind places like Google when it comes to self-driving technology. Now, Uber wouldn't comment on how much they paid for Auto. Uh, we talked about Auto in May. Mm -hmm. They were um, a small startup uh, that was focused on truck self-driving trucks, um, you know, in the enterprise space. So um, they say self-driving trucks, they want to... 
provide self-driving trucks that provide drivers unprecedented levels of safety, which that sentence didn't really make sense to me. Um, hmm. Self-driving trucks that provide drivers unprecedented <laughs> levels of safety. Is it self-driving or not? So, I mean, I'm assuming if you're talking about a truck with a lot of stuff in it, there would still be a driver in there. So, um, and then maybe, you know, we talk, maybe they could take a nap for a while right. or it would be fun, like all they would need to do is take over, but they wouldn't need to be as alert as a truck driver needs to be now. Right, right. And a big part of this is the whole kits aspect which is you know part of what what auto is doing um bringing their self-driving kits which essentially like when i think about that i mean obviously obviously with uber auto becomes their r d department for all things self-driving but they've also got the kits aspect so maybe they could maybe it could be a conversion for people who are bringing their own cars uh at some point i don't know who knows uh, you know maybe that opens up the the field for both sides of things um but they're not breaking up the team the auto team and that's a, a good thing because basically uber has been working on its own global mapping project it really wants to wean itself from google maps which it really relies on right now um especially considering the fact that google and uber in many ways are becoming rivals instead of partners which they've been in the past and so one of the uh one of the part of the team of auto is uh leo ron who is the head of product at google maps so that's going to help in many more ways than just one than just the self-driving aspect mm -hmm. also kind of the mapping knowledge for their other project so bleak in our chat room pointed out that self-driving trucks that provide drivers unprecedented levels of safety could mean other drivers but then i don't know why they would just say drivers and not other passengers and other people on the road and dogs and cats and the other things that could get hit by a self-driving car. Yeah, I mean, if I remember back to when we were talking about auto, um, it was about, you know, it, it was calling out the fact that drivers of these trucks can only drive for so long before, you know, this scenario is potentially dangerous and that auto technology would allow them to push that by, like you were saying, take a nap while it's driving. I don't know if they'd allow you to do that right now. That sounds a little beyond what we are seeing in other facets of self-driving vehicles but maybe it's more that it's that if you're a truck driver and you know you've got you've got these long shifts and everything auto and the technology behind it is just meant to make your experience safer to not just put you behind the wheel for 18 solid hours and you fall asleep and game over yeah i think that i mean with all of this it's just we're slowly getting used to it it's going to be mm -hmm. things like autopilot it's going to be better cruise control it's going to be automatic braking automatic parking and slowly 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 all of a sudden we're in our robot cars and everything's wonderful for the rest auto of our pilot auto mm -hmm. pilot does that work no sure that doesn't work <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't know what he was saying. You may remember the super secretive social network from a few years back called Secret. It was very secret. That's why it was called Secret. Uh, they ultimately decided to exit the business because, well, it's super hard to make a startup that focuses on anonymity while still keeping users and content from dipping into the depths of bullying and trollism and all that kind of stuff. Yik Yak is learning a lesson from companies like Secret and shifting away from total anonymity, which has been its core focus up until now, and towards connecting you to people who are close by. Users will be forced to add a photo and a handle for the service and asked to post status updates about the things users are up to on any given day. Nearby yakers will be able to reach them uh, through the app. Uh, basically, a focus on the local graph. They, they've kind of analyzed the social scenario right now, and they say so many different you know, solutions exist, but there really is no good social network for the nearby. And that's what they hope to do. For instance, what bar is everyone on campus headed to right now? You know, it's highly focused up until now, and they still plan to, at least in the short term, focus on like university um, you know, universities, that's a kind of a prime ground for people who are all there for a similar reason and might all want to know what others who are there, um, you know, have to say about a certain topic. Yeah, what bar you're going to. That's basically yeah, that's, they, that's the most important question, I would imagine. Uh, so, yeah, this is a weird market, right? They, they point out that, I mean, people that are in college, they leave. They leave for the summer. Right. Uh, they grow up. They move away. They graduate, and they're gone. And so then, you know, that market is gone for you. I mean, look at Snapchat. Like, they realize it was something that the kids liked, but now they're working very hard to get adults there. Same mm -hmm. thing with Facebook. That's what Facebook did. I, it just seems like another social network that we don't need. Um, yeah, I don't know. Ask someone what the bar that everyone is oh, going to. Oh, please. <laughs> I mean, 
we don't need it because we're not going to college. But I could total, I could totally understand. Like when I was going to university or when I was going to college, probably because I was a little bit younger when I started in college, um, wanting to know these kinds of things. And if there was an app, a if there were smartphones, and b if there was an app that allowed me to like know that I could connect with the people that were around me and kind of part of that discussion, I would totally tap into it. I think that would be an interesting tool. How about Facebook? Well. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's actually kind of different. Like Facebook has those op those options, but Facebook is very isolated to the people you already follow. Yik Yak, it seems like to a certain degree, yes, there's there's a certain focus on the people you know, but there's also just a, a focus on everything that's nearby that surrounds you. You know, just being there gives you access to this population of people that are also just being there. And that gives you, you know, the ability to touch base on certain things that you couldn't if it was just based on a pure follower uh, status. I don't know. Are you going to invest in Yik Yak? It sounds like you're real pro Yik Yak. No, no I'm not going to invest <laughs> in Yik Yak. I mean, they, they've got a lot of challenges, right? Like, if, like you say, if it's focused on university, um, they have to figure at some point how to move beyond that their user their monthly user account has declined after stagnating for like a year and a half straight so they've got challenges based on the fact that they've targeted this market that uh is can only get so big also you know no matter how popular it is and you mentioned facebook it's the prime example facebook started off in universities and then eventually realized they had to move it, you know, move it up and allow everybody in in order for it to become the the crazy, you know, thing that it is now. Yeah, I mean, the the other big part of this story, right, is that they're not anonymous anymore, and you know, and they're right. saying like there's no room for this, and I that makes me sad. Like I wish there was room for anonymity. Like I still. Yeah, it's just anonymity brings out the worst in people sometimes, and I think it's hard to. It's hard to, to build capital and, you know, get support, financial support when your business is, you know, because in the early days, they, they didn't have the barring of geofences in high schools, which they basically have now. And as a result, you know, the, the, there were many reports about like bullying, you know, bullying through Yik Yak and all this kind of stuff that you really couldn't control at all. And so when it comes to investors, you know, wanting to invest in something, they see that it's just riddled with that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what anonymity can bring. And that's mm -hmm. what ultimately puts Secret out, out of business. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you to Dana Schwartz for tipping me off to an article in Advertising Age about a new revenue stream by Verizon. Ad Age says the company wants to get paid by installing other companies' bloatware on your phone. This so-called brandware could potentially deliver millions of downloads and Verizon reportedly wanted between $1 and $2 per device install. That means you didn't even have to use the app. You just had to open it up and they got to install it. That, mm -hmm. you, know, you didn't even have to use it for them to get paid. Uh, Verizon bloatware is not new, of course, but these specific paid for preloaded apps that Verizon was pitching to advertisers are new. Uh, of course, we don't know if any advertisers bought onto this. They, their sources said at, at age didn't know that. Apple prohibits carriers from pre-installing apps on iPhones, which is one of those somewhat rare cases where having a lockdown phone has its advantages. Now, Nexus phones also don't come with carrier apps, right? Uh, well, actually, that depends. Not, not entirely true. Nexus devices that release on carriers can have uh, pre-installed apps. And uh, that's actually, we're starting to see this kind of bubble up again because for... You know, it was. I think it was the Galaxy Nexus. Well, I know it was the Galaxy Nexus because I had the Galaxy Nexus on Verizon, and you know, ultimately ended up calling it the Fallacy Nexus because all of the, you know, you ended up getting uh, pre-installed apps on there. You ended up being slowed down on on security updates because it was behind the the Verizon wall of security that slows things down by literally months. Uh, it, you know, it it had these things that Nexus devices are known not to have, mm -hmm. just for the fact that it's part of a carrier deal. And uh, it's like making a deal with the devil. You get the, the wider distribution, but with that, come, you know, you end up having to come, go back on some of these promises that the Nexus brand, it, you know, in general uh, brings with it. And we're starting to see that now, the rumors around the new Nexus devices is that they will have carrier versions. And Verizon is one of the carriers that is rumored to uh, have the new Nexus devices. So pretty much kind of guessing that that this might actually play a part in that. But you possible. can get a non-carrier version of the Nexus. You can. Yeah, you can buy it totally unlocked. You can buy it through Google, and you're not going to get uh, pre-installed stuff on there, and you'll get the updates as fast as Google can put them out uh, in most cases. So that's definitely the better way to go. Um, 
and I think another interesting aspect of this is not just that there's pr that there's apps on the devices from the moment that you buy it because we've seen that like I've just you know just said about the Galaxy Nexus but that this is using a feature this would use a feature called play auto install feature I think it was introduced back in Lollipop that essentially means that when you're going through the setup process you get to a certain point and it hits the Play Store and starts to download the apps uh, automatically on your phone. So not only is this for the people who do the deal, not only is this their app existing on the phone for the customer to use, but it's also another download from the Play Store that gets logged oh. for everyone to see. So it drives up the download numbers and uh, makes it seem that much more important. <laughs> 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 the tricks they play over mm -hmm. the carriers. Uh, okay, get ready for an acronym salad. For 20 years, the United States, also known as the U.S., has had a hand in controlling the domain name system, or DNS, that acts as a translation directory for IP. That's Internet Protocol addresses. Uh, DNS is critical to the Internet, and as such, many felt having its control in the hands of a single entity wasn't the best solution for all. So two days ago, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA as I like to call them, signed off on handing responsibility for DNS to the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Let's just call them ICANN, for example. <laughs> See, uh, I warned you about the acronym. So then what does this mean? It means that ICANN, a nonprofit organization whose members include, you know, tech giants, governments, and other in interested entities gets administrative control over how DNS is managed. <sighs> there you go. Does that make it, it even make any sense? There you uh, go. Yes. Sort does, of. does it mean that I can get the um, URL monkeypants.com again? which I once uh, had back in the day. I would imagine you could if you go to a site and pl plug it in and nobody has it. <laughs> no, is it taken? It's taken. Okay. It's taken. I don't think this does anything to no, change your good. ability to get it. It really doesn't way. change anything for <laughs> anything, right? Like Not ICANN really. has been just administrative duties at this point. Yeah, exactly. The U.S. was was basically filling the role of administrator for this for, for 20 years. And now ICANN is going to be in control of it. I mean, the the... Questions that some people have had about this, you know, are things like if ICANN, which is currently uh, headquartered in Los Angeles, if it were to relocate to some other country, because ICANN has offices all around the world, let's say it re relocates to Switzerland or another place where they have an office, could that change the dynamics or the rules that it operates under because it's no longer in, you know, operated out uh, inside the U.S.? So there are certain risks, but the U.S., basically started this process on their own. They decided uh, that it was time to you know, put these wheels in motion. That was about two years ago to get the process started. And they say they, they wanted to do it now because they see the private sector internet as being mature enough to do it. Now is a good time. But, you know, I'm sure Snowden relate, uh, revelations and other things probably had something to do with that too. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah, that's Snowden. Uh, up next, the, speaking of Snowden, I'm sure he's going to come up in this next uh, segment. The Register's Ian Thompson joins us once again uh, this week with an update on the story from earlier this week regarding the NSA being hacked. But first, let's take a minute to thank Epson, the sponsor of this episode. Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer does not use ink cartridges. It features an awesome, uh, innovative, refillable ink tank. Earned it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. No more out-of-ink frustration, which I've experienced more than a few times. Uh, it includes up to two years of ink, equal to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. You can save up to 80% on ink with low-cost replacement bottles. And it's powered by precision core printing technology. It has auto two-sided printing, a 30-page auto document feeder, and uh, it's easy wireless printing. So you can use your tablet, your smartphone, and just print wirelessly. Uh, all EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's EcoTank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. That's E-P-S-O-N.com slash EcoTank 
and we thank Epson for their support. All right, have you ever awoke at night with a cold sweat saying to yourself, what in the world is epic banana and extra bacon? <laughs> yes. That's what I thought. Ian Thompson is here to tell you what that dream of mine meant. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> Hi there, Jason. Good to speak to you again. <laughs> Good to have you back. All right, so that was you actually... Weird dreams, man. <laughs> I know. I've got strange dreams. Uh, that was actually a very horrible setup, so I'll go ahead and try that again. Uh, there have been developments in the NSA vulnerability and hack story uh, that we had you on to discuss this Monday. But before we get to the part that involves Cisco, you then on Monday, you were somewhat doubt doubtful of the veracity of the news uh, then that we knew. Uh, are you more convinced now that it might have actually happened or still kind of on the fence? Um, I'm about 80% convinced at okay. this point. Um, I know on Monday I did describe it as bollocks, but I now think that it may be it's, there might be something in this. The fact that people have gone through it and found workable exploits that we didn't know about. Um, I've also, we've also been chatting to Kaspersky, who are the original experts on the equation group, and they seem pretty sure that the code that they're that you know that they that they're seeing matches up with the kind of stuff that the equation group was doing so um yeah at this point i'd, I'd go 80 percent all right um it's it's hard to admit that you may have been wrong but you know i'm out of my word on that sort of thing sadly no hats to be eaten but no. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we've got plenty of hats around here uh right the oh, app cap good. we've got lots of app caps that you could probably eat if you wanted to if you're hungry um <laughs> Now, you, now, also, you said that some some are claiming that the link could have actually been an inside job. Is that a, uh, I mean, how much of a possibility uh, would I've, that be? I've seen a couple of reports on it. Um, it's, well, I mean, after Snowden, inside job leaks are, are you know, are, are one of those things that the NSA is, is going to have to deal with. Although sure. I suspect they're cracking down an awful lot. And making sure that absolutely nobody has has access to the kind of uh, kind of kind of information that he had. Um, I've seen a report that it may have been a leaker, but I I got to say I think it's more likely that what we got, uh, what they managed to hack into is an old command and control server, uh, and uh, the stuff that's in there isn't particularly current. So, it's I think to be honest, it does look as though the command control servers have been have been gone into. They're they're um, Contents have been copied, and as you mentioned, Edward Snowden, he has, of course, chimed in and said that this is a warning to the NSA from the Russians, saying basically, don't try and retaliate for our hack against the Democratic uh, Party's servers, uh, otherwise we will out you as being behind some of the major some major hacking incidents by exposing your tools. Oof. Well, I mean, uh, I think a lot of times a lot of people take what Snowden says as just like, oh, it, he's Edward Snowden, it must right. be true. Um, but, yes. in, but in this sense, it, I mean, it seems like that's likely. And, and so basically we can boil it down to like he's saying, we have some pictures of your sister, so stop messing with us or we'll post them somewhere. You know, <laughs> I, th I, th I think that's right. And I mean, there have been commentators in the U.S. calling for... Uh, the NSA and others to actually go and hack Russian politicians and expose all their dirty deals. Uh, I think, A, if they did that, that would be a, a very, very dodgy move in terms of rules of war. Uh, but yeah, I think there, are, you know, there is sense in what Snowden is saying that this could be a shot across the bows for the NSA. Uh, that said, he has been out of the loop for quite a while, so you know, it, it's not certain, but he knows more about this stuff than most people. So... Um, if he honestly thinks that's the way it's going, then uh, also quite gutsy of him to say it, considering who his landlords are at the moment. But um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Good point. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So tell us a little bit about how Cisco comes into play. This I think this news kind of broke more yesterday, but what's Cisco? Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, well, when the uh, export list went out, uh, myself and other journalists got in contact with Cisco because. You know, they were, you know, their products were actually included in, in, included in the archive. And I know the Cisco Talos team quite well, and they were spending sort of burning the midnight oil going through this stuff. And they found two vulnerabilities um, which uh, contained within the archive uh, with rather silly names, as you pointed out. Um, now, one of these vulnerabilities actually, they've actually known about and had a patch out for since 2011, um, which does sort of... This is one of the reasons why I'm slightly iffy about the archive. You know, if it's got patched stuff from 2011, admittedly, not everyone patches their firewalls as well as they should. But, you know, it's still a very old, old bit of stuff. But the other was complete zero day. And so they've issued the patch for that now. 
Um, and the fact that it's it's actually quite a serious one as well. I mean, you've got to have insider access to the network to activate it. But once you do, you can run whatever you like on the Cisco, uh, you know, within the Cisco environment. So uh, it's, a, it's important if you are running Cisco Kit, get patched now because this exploit is out there and you know malware writers are already writing code to exploit it. But the fact that they, there was a zero day in there that Cisco themselves weren't aware of is potentially worrying for, on two levels. One, it does indicate that this was, you know, this was a, a hacking toolkit. But two, if it was, and if the equation group are getting their information from the NSA, it means that uh, the, the people entrusted with keeping American computer equipment safe sat on a zero day and did nothing, nothing with, uh, and didn't inform the manufacturer, didn't try and patch it. Now, there was an interesting talk at this uh, on uh, DEF CON a couple of weeks ago, the hacking conference, and a State Department insider said that about 91% of the zero days that the NSA discovers, they inform manufacturers about. Now, this obviously wasn't one of those. It was one of the one, one of the nine percent. But it does make you wonder how many zero days they're sitting on, and how much it's putting the, everyone else at risk, not getting them fixed. No kidding. And and just the, I mean, I have to imagine if there is a zero day that they were sitting on. I mean, they were compelled to do that by the NSA, right? I mean, that, that well, kind I mean, of Cisco has to did, be the case. Cisco didn't even know about it. That was the thing. Um, basically, somebody discovered this zero day, uh, and then. And then just and then sat on it and did nothing with it. So if this was if this stems from the NSA and judging from the silly names, it, it it's likely to, then it means that this was a zero day which they just you know right. they weren't prepared to fix and they were quite happy to carry on using. And who knows else? Who knows who else found it? This is the problem with with keeping these things quiet because it might sound good. Oh yes, we can spy on people using this, but other people are going to find it if you did, and they're going to use it in exactly the same way. So. It comes with whether or not you're thinking about offense or defense in this mode. Yeah, I guess that was, that was one of my big questions, is just the fact that there are tons of super smart hackers in this world. Um, and, you know, the NSA, at least in this case, you know, had some sort of a discovery method that allowed them to find this thing that nobody else had found. I, it's hard for me to think that with all of the smart hackers out there who are constantly looking for things, um, that only the NSA was ever able to find this one vulnerability. Like, that just seems too far-fetched for me to believe. Oh, yes. I mean, if something like this exists, then people will find it. Right. It's kind of like the, the argument, we, uh, um, we, the discussion that we've had in the past about encryption. You know, it sounds like a great idea. Build a floor into the encryption so that law enforcement can always break it. But anyone can find it if it's yeah. there, and particularly if you tell people it's there. And it's the same in this case. You know, if we've got serious zero days, such as this, this, this Cisco thing was, it's, I would think, more logical to patch it and or to let the manufacturer know so that they can patch it, which makes everyone safer, um, rather than just keep it hanging around because, as you say, someone else is going to find it, someone else is going to use it. And the fact that an awful lot of networking gear is made out, made out in China and they have access to sort of source code on, on a lot of things, that would make me really nervous if I was, you know, as a computer user, knowing that my own government was keeping this stuff from me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, Ian Thompson, always a pleasure getting you on. I'm happy that we got you on again to kind of get a follow up to see where we where we stand. Always here. a pleasure. Yeah. Yes, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, TheRegister.co.uk and Ian Thompson on Twitter. Always, always so much fun to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. Always good to be here. Cheers. Have a good right. day. Take care, Ian. So here's some feedback. Damon Talbot writes about our discussion of disaster relief donations to Louisiana. He writes, I volunteer for Humanity Road, which does digital disaster response. The organization uses social media to find information from official agencies, urgent need requests from those affected and provide them out via Facebook and Twitter. The other part of it is in larger disasters, such as the current floods, we will put together a full situation report, such as our current one for the Louisiana floods. Our disaster response volunteers are all self-directed, and we take on parts of tasks that are best suited for our skills, not only does that include social media, but graphics, creative arts, software, program development, fundraising, and other tasks. We're not working disasters. When not working disasters, we do special projects and partner with various government and NGOs worldwide for training exercises or special event monitoring. I encourage you to check them out. Passing this along to the tech community is always a perfect match as we are always looking for new volunteers that want to help or at least be on call for larger scale emergencies. 
So thank you so much for writing us, Damon. I think if anybody wants to volunteer their time, I know there are a lot of developers, a lot of people who know a lot about social media and tech. And if you uh, want to do something for the floods, uh, flood victims or an, another disaster, um, check out their volunteer page and you can sign up. Um, I under, as I understand, it's something you can do from home. So uh, nice. it sounds like great a great way to help. Yeah, humanityroad.org is where you want to go for that. Thank you for writing. If the goal of research universities is to further innovation, why are they selling their patents to trolls? Elliot Harmon from the EFF is here to explain. But first, let's thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. So you found the perfect house with a white picket fence and a living room that you can dedicate to your VR addiction. It sounds perfect. But first, you have to get through the excruciating mortgage process, but it doesn't have to be excruciating. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast, powerful, and completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. If you hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork, you don't have to. With Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and your pay stubs at the touch of a button, helping you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. Even better, with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this from your phone or tablet. That's all we really want, to do everything in our lives from our phone or tablet. That's all I really want. It's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. So if you're looking to refinance your mortgage or buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Patent trolls. Now, these are the kinds of companies, we talk about them a lot. They exist solely to collect patents and then take people to court to demand money. They're the thorns in the sides of tech companies, big and small. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has long defended the rights of innovators against so-called patent trolls. And they just announced a new effort. Joining us to talk about it, it's Elliot Harmon, an activist at the EFF, focusing on patent law, open access, and copyright reform. Welcome, Elliot. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. So Reclaim Invention is a new project dedicated to stopping patent trolling at the university level. Uh, why focus on universities? It's it's kind of been, you know, when you look at the long history of the fight against patent trolls, we fight them in a lot of different ways. Um, one of those ways is in the courts. One of them is in the legislature. We're trying very hard to get uh, patent litigation uh, reform passed in Congress. But... In addition to those things, you should look at the so sources, the the ways in which patent trolls get their weapons, which are patents. Um, and to the extent that we can keep those weapons out of trolls' hands, we can do a great favor to innovation in America and everywhere. Um, and one of those sources that's not always talked about very much is universities. Um, universities have, over the years, uh, patented much more of the uh, inventions that arise from their research. Uh, it's been a kind of growing trend ever since 1980 when the laws changed, making it easier for universities to file patents. And inevitably, a lot of those patents uh, end up in the hands of trolls, either by outright selling them to them uh, or by exclusive licensing agreements. Um, and what we are saying is essentially uh, universities should look at these practices and consider that selling patents to trolls kind of undermines the very purpose of university research in the first place, which is to spread innovation. Uh, trolls create this kind of de facto tax on innovation, which is you know, very literally undermining a research university's entire purpose. Well, that, that's what this surprised me so much, because you think of, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I think of universities like a separation, you know, that they, you know, as opposed to big corporations, you hear a lot about, you know, big corporations coming in like Uber and like, you know, poaching all these employees from Carnegie Mellon or something. You think of the, them being these places that, that would be really against selling the their patents. Why, why do they do it? Do they not know? That's a tough question. And sometimes I don't always know exactly why why they do it. And to be fair, a lot of universities have 
talked about this issue and have made steps to try to fight it. Um, I mentioned this in my blog post. Uh, there's a couple of these kind of organizations of tech transfer offices. Tech transfer, that's what they call the offices at a university that uh, manage the licensing and sales for these patents. Um, a number of these uh uh, organizations of tech transfer offices have actually talked about this problem and have even published guidelines uh, saying when you're thinking about who to license patents to, you should license them to companies that will actually use them to spread those inventions and and not companies that will just use them to try to extract licensing fees from others. Um, so why do they keep doing it? I think that to a certain extent, it's that those good policy statements aren't enough. Uh, those, um, it's not enough to simply point out that the problem exists. Uh, you need to actually put a stake in the ground and change your patenting policies. It almost seems to me like, you know, when you're talking about universities, all of this education built around, you know, creating things that are innovative and patenting them and everything. Part of the process of, of a university obviously is educating on, you know, the, the right way or the, you know, the ethical way of doing whatever it is that they're teaching. It kind of seems like part of that should be part of the curriculum of, all right, here's the next step. You have a patent. How do you sell it? Who do you sell it to? It really seems like a no-brainer. Is it easy to assess from their perspective uh, whether a business uh, or, you know, whether an entity is in fact a patent troll or has plans to take that innovation and put it to good use? Um, that's a fair question. And it, like, in a way, the answer is no, right? Like you sell a patent to a business that doesn't yet know exactly what it's going to do. There's always kind of that risk. On the other hand, we do know about some of those places that they're sure. being transferred to. And the biggest one is this very notorious uh, patent assertion company called Intellectual Ventures, which has agreements literally with dozens of universities and ingests lots and lots of patents from them on these exclusive licensing agreements. Um, so no, you can't catch all of them, but you can catch most of them. And all we're really asking is that universities make that assessment of uh the past practices of whoever they're transferring the patent to and whether that business gets most of its uh income from litigation or from other sources we're just asking them to make that assessment part of the process uh before you decide who to sell or license a patent to sure so you said you're working a lot of levels and you mentioned congress uh tell us a little bit about faster the fair access to science and technology research act um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because open access is a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, what FASTER will do is require that any research uh, that is publicly funded, i.e., you know, scientific research or whatever kind of research is, is uh, funded by the federal government, uh, has to be available to the public after a certain amount of time after it's been published. Um, and it's looking really good. I would encourage people to go to our website and send your Congress people a letter about FASTER. It's looking like it might actually finally pass this year, but we still need to make as much noise about it to Congress as we can. What's interesting is, to me, these two topics, open access to research and uh, universities changing their tech transfer policies, to me, those two topics really go hand in hand because in a lot of ways we're making progress. Universities are putting in place open access policies. A lot more research is becoming available to the public. But if that very same research is being used to litter the field with these landmines that could potentially explode on uh, inventors and innovators in the future, then universities aren't doing their job. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, hopefully that passes. And if not, what can people do to support the reclaim invention if they're at a university, um, working at a university or involved? What can they do? I would encourage everybody watching this right now to go to reclaiminvention.org uh, or just go to EFF.org and there's a big link on the homepage there and fill out our petition. Now, what the petition is basically doing is saying, look, I, as a student at a university, as an alumnus or alumna, as a parent of somebody at the university, as a faculty member, um, 
I want my university to take this issue seriously, and I want my university to agree not to sell patents to trolls. Um, the petition has been up for about a day, and I think we've had 1,300 people sign it, which is fantastic, but we want to make a lot more noise. That's all step number one. Step number two is we need local people who are on the ground in those university communities, be it faculty, uh, students, whomever, we need them to be the ones to then take that message to the university leadership. So you can t take this petition and circulate it to all of your contacts and get hundreds of signatures on it. And then you can take the results of that petition to your university leadership and tell them, look, we need to uh, uh, commit to this right now. Um, and we're eager to help people with that process. And in fact, you can even just email me directly, Elliot at EFF.org, uh, and I would be eager to help you make sure that that message gets heard by your university leadership. Well, Elliot Harmon, thank you so much for joining us. I love thank your you. passion about this. Uh, Elliot can be found at Elliot at EFF.org and uh, at Elliot Harmon on Twitter and at the EFF. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can find a link to the Reclaim Innovation Project on the EFF blog or Google it, uh, or we'll have it in our show notes. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Take care. All right. TNT's fan of the day is Mohammed al uh at Mohamed Full on Twitter, with the show on a big screen in the background and the iNaturalist site on the laptop in on his lap. Uh, I'm guessing Mohammed is tracking the rare species of Jason. <laughs> Got to catch them all. Got to catch them all. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and others. Uh, we just might not find them there. Uh, <laughs> eventually, we will. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT. And if you do that, then we definitely will someday. Up next, hey, taxi, take me to the moon. But first, before you take me to the moon, let's take a minute to thank Wealthfront. They are the sponsor of this episode. You invest for the long term, for you, for your family's financial health. But trying to do it all yourself, especially the right way, is complex. It's time consuming. It's not easy. Luckily, there's Wealthfront. Traditional advisors charge huge fees between 1% to 3% of what they manage. With Wealthfront, you pay one quarter of 1% a year. That's 25 basis points, zero commissions, and no hidden fees. It's less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account. There are no additional charges for any of Wealthfront's services. You can get started investing today with as little as $500. Unlike other financial advisors, Wealthfront won't bog you down with dozens of questions. They've simplified their risk identification process, which allows you to begin investing sooner. It only takes a few minutes to sign up, goes right to work, monitoring your portfolios around the clock, takes action as soon as an opportunity arises. Uh, Wealthfront portfolios are based on modern portfolio theory, and they're designed to adjust according to your personal risk tolerance while staying diversified and tax efficient. Wealthfront is transparent and accessible. You can view and track all your accounts in one place. Wealthfront can track both your Wealthfront and non-Wealthfront bank and brokerage accounts that they'll provide in a summary of all your assets you can see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf, on, on your desktop in the dashboard that they provide, or with their mobile app. Wealthfront recently introduced their 529 college savings plan, allowing you to invest after-tax dollars, much like a Roth IRA, uh, and save for your child or your grandchild's higher education expenses. Wealthfront manages almost $3 billion in client assets, and it's growing rapidly every day. So what are you waiting for? Invest in your future today with Wealthfront. Visit www.wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You're going to get a customized allocation that they recommend for your profile. And just for Twit listeners, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. Join the many Twit fans who've seen huge success with Wealthfront and claim your offer today at www.wealthfront.com slash TNT. All right, Jason, I heard you saying that you wanted to go into space on a taxi. I would love that. Are you an are astronaut? Are you offering? Uh, are you an astronaut? Oh, well, I'm not. Okay, no. then you can't. You have to be an astronaut. Fine. Uh, to ride the space taxi. Fast Company says that a partnership between NASA, Boeing, and SpaceX will start shuttling astronauts to the International Space Station starting next year. And tomorrow they are heading up to pave space and 
put up a parking lot and you can watch it all happen live on NASA's live streaming YouTube station at 8.03 tomorrow morning, 8.05 Eastern Daylight Time. How do they plan on paving space? I don't know. I don't know how they plan on paving that, that paradise. Seems... They're not really paving it. Oh. Uh, and the parking lots are just for the commercial partners like SpaceX and Boeing. Mm. Not so for... not for our personal space vehicles. Uh, no. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Not for Uber's space taxi, which you know someday <laughs> down the line Uber's going to have to open up their business and then be like, well, space is the next frontier for our it autonomous is. flight vehicles. It is perhaps the final frontier. Uh, possibly. <laughs> possibly. Um, I, I do wish that I were an astronaut so that I could go park in their parking lot. Uh, but no, I'm well, going to have to wait. it's not too late to be an astronaut. It kind of is. I think it's probably a little too late for is me. Is it? Yeah. Oh. I feel like I'm too old to be an astronaut at this point. Maybe not too old to be an astronaut, but you don't start being an astronaut from, from nothing uh, at my age. You didn't go to space camp? Nope. Okay. I didn't, but I watched the movie, and I don't know if that counts. I think that's enough. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, that is it. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. But no, not tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last episode of TNT here at the Brick House, <laughs> and it'll be earlier than normal at 10 a.m. Pacific. Literally right after our show wraps, the rest of the studio will be broken down and moved to our new location, the East Side Studio here in Petaluma. So expect things to look very different next Monday, uh, possibly even tomorrow, although I think things are going to stay still until we're done with our show. Uh, but what won't be changing is how you can reach us. Send your emails to TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. And find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can also find us on Twit on Sunday. No, yes, that's right. We will be yes. on Twit on Sunday. So, yes. So if you uh, are not around at 10, 10 a.m. tomorrow, watch, you know, you can watch the downloaded. You can subscribe to the show, which is what I always tell you at this point. So subscribe so you can watch that. And go ahead and subscribe to Twit if you haven't already. Because yeah. Jason and I will be with Leo and Father Robert, uh, Father Bowser. Robert and possibly others. Yeah. Maybe a, you. Maybe you will be there. We'll, I know uh, Evan, who uh, tweets at us, he'll be there, and there'll be lots of other people live in the audience. It's going to be kind of a crazy day, actually. There's a, lo a bunch of stuff planned for um, bit taking a trolley, right, or something, kind of moseying on from here to the other studio. It's going to be craziness. Yes. Uh, so if you have any suggestions of uh, what we should do on the trolley, tweet at me, <laughs> at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. I have a feeling they're going to ask for cake stands or something along those lines. I I'm don't not think doing they'll let that. us do that. Not until after the, the Twit episode is done. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thanks to Patrick De La Hanty for sitting in the, the words chair. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs>